Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode. I'm Nathan, the podcast host. Um, before you, we get to the episode, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and also if you follow us on Spotify. And I don't know why I'm saying us because it's just me. But yeah, if you can like the video and share it as well, that would be much appreciated. Uh, the podcast is in pay partnership with The Flawed Journey, um, who's run by my girlfriend and her team are young. Uh, they're offering counseling sessions at an affordable rate and you won't be expected to wait on long waiting lists like most counseling sessions or therapy practices around the world do. Um, so yeah, if you look in the description, you'll get a code um, which you can use to get your first therapy session free. So now that that's out of the way, enjoy the episode. everyone welcome to this week's episode today i'm joined with dr julia cogan how are you i'm good that's great uh thanks very much for coming on like i said before um sort of a disclaimer to everyone who's listening uh i only know sleep through reading one book and actually doing it myself so i'm not an expert in this that's why i've got an expert on and um, i'm going to ask really 101 questions to you so uh please don't think i'm stupid i'm just uh kind of speaking for everyone here <laughs> no no such thing as stupid questions and you know sleep is it's a very complex and, and complicated subject so i think starting from you know the basics it would be helpful for probably most people brilliant perfect um so yeah let's get a kicking off with uh, just yourself julia do you want to introduce yourself for my listeners yeah, so I'm Dr. Julia Kogan. I am a health psychologist. I specialize in behavioral medicine. So I work with people to understand how their physical health, their emotional health, um, and other kind of whole health factors go together to impact their health um, and affect different things like sleep, their medical conditions. Um, so I currently manage a um, pretty large primary care behavioral health program where we are embedded in primary care. So when people are going to their primary care doctor, um, rather than only being treated from a kind of traditional medical approach, they're also being treated from that whole health perspective. And sleep is something that comes up pretty regularly. Lots of people struggle with sleep. Um, you know, up to 50% of the population has some kind of trouble with sleep and around 30% struggle from what we would consider to be clinical insomnia, um, which can really interfere in their lives. So if you're listening to this and you're having trouble with sleep, you're certainly not alone. This is a very, very common thing. Um, and sleep is very complex and often the time... Um, Oftentimes, it we struggle with sleep just because there are so many factors that can really negatively impact our sleep. So those are some things that we'll talk about today to help people see you know, if they can make maybe some small changes that could improve their sleep. Great, perfect. And um, just you touched on it there for a second about uh, about how your usual GP they they kind of wouldn't be um, specialized in sleep, wouldn't they? Not they would kind of just go off what they would get off WebMD, which like make sure you get eight hours. Do you think that's uh, do you think that's kind of a downfall for GPs that they're not kind of experienced more in sleep? Um, by GPs, you mean like general practitioners? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, general practitioners, they will be pretty um, experienced in sleep, but oftentimes they'll be paying most attention to the presence of any sleep disorders. Um, so they'll be really kind of paying more attention to, is there kind of some form of sleep disorder? Um, and they will, you know, give kind of more general guidance. That guidance, you know, is helpful and important, but, you know, from kind of a medical perspective in a medical appointment, there might be just other things that they have to focus and spend their time more on. Um, so there is a lot of actually um, a lot of change going on. I work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. So this has a, been a huge push for a long time now, but in a lot of other medical settings, um, there is a lot of change where we are really trying to integrate um, more aspects of health into kind of that traditional medical model. And that's why a lot of places are developing teams. So even if the general practitioner or primary care doctor is focusing more on maybe medical things, there's someone on the team who can really work with someone more extensively to improve sleep or you know whatever else might be going on. Okay, cool. And you just mentioned there as well that you're working with uh, veterans. I take it that that's, would that be very like challenging? Would you be like sort of looking at things like uh, PTSD and stuff like that and how that would like contribute to like their sleep patterns? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of, um, and this is not just, you know, specific to veterans, but there's a lot of different kinds of mood changes or kind of mental health um, conditions that can impact sleep. PTSD is certainly one of them. So, um, you know, veterans can suffer from PTSD, but certainly there's many people who can have PTSD who are not a veteran as well. Um, depression can impact sleep. Anxiety can impact sleep. Um, so there's a lot of kind of like emotional um, factors and mental health conditions that could also impact sleep. So that's always going to be an important aspect of uh, making sure that, you know, we're really kind of analyzing all aspects of sleep. Okay, cool. And this is totally off the topic. Well, it's kind of not. Um, have you seen the movie Inception? Um, I think I've heard of it. I don't think I've seen it. <laughs> it's mind blowing. It's uh, basically where they uh, jump dreams. Leo uh, DiCaprio is in it. And uh, I think uh, Joseph Levesque Gordon as well. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I don't know if I got those uh, those names mixed up, but uh, yeah, they like uh, they sort of go inside of a dream of another dream of another dream. And um, I just wanted to always ask like a sleep doctor that if like they think that that's absolute nonsense and it's just Hollywood or could that actually happen? <laughs> Uh, I, without seeing the movie, it's hard, it's hard to know exactly what you're um, talking about, but we have, you know, dreams, we only have a certain level kind of of control over them. So I'll have to watch the movie and maybe get back to you on that of, of the specifics of it. But, you know, yeah. dreaming is an important part of sleep. So we, um, one of the cycles that we go through is called REM. And that's oftentimes when we will remember the dreams that we do have. Um, sleep is something that's been studied for some time, but we're still, you know, trying to figure out a lot about it, but one thing that we think that REM cycle is for and dreaming is for processing of emotions, um, especially kind of more difficult emotions. So that's not, uh, sometimes people have dreams about like really vivid things. Sometimes it's related to things going on in their life, sometimes not, but there's still kind of an emotional um, component to it. Um, so it's thought that that stage is to help with, um, you know, kind of regulation of emotions and processing. Right. Okay. So like, with the re so because i know there is a uh, three different stages of sleep there's a uh, your light ram there's your deep ram and then there's is it deep sleep as well uh, yep. Yeah, so that was pretty close. So the first stage of sleep is our just we would consider just our light sleep. So that is kind of if you were just kind of like, let's say, like dozing somewhere and someone said your name, you'd respond to it pretty quickly. Um, so that's kind of our, our first stage. Our second stage is um, still light, um, but it is a little bit deeper than that first stage. If you had fallen asleep, we'd have to maybe like poke you a little bit more to wake up. Um, and then we go into stage three. That's considered the deep sleep. So that is where um, a lot of um, processing is going to happen. And that is where we're going to really get that restorative sleep. That's important for us to feel you know, functional and productive the next day. Um, if we woke someone up in deep sleep, they probably wake up really groggy and kind of disoriented. Um, and then from there, we go into the REM sleep. So all of this in a night, it's about like 90 minutes or so. So a sleep cycle is anywhere from like 90 to 100 minutes, and then it repeats throughout the night. As the night goes on, um, deep sleep is, there's more deep sleep in the beginning of the night and less REM sleep as the second half of the night goes on, then it's the opposite. We have less deep sleep and more of that um, REM sleep. So people who are um, skimping on sleep regularly, they probably are going to be missing some aspects, um, likely for most people in that second half of the night um, of some of that REM sleep. Um, so a lot of times um, people will kind of sacrifice sleep to do other things, whether that's work or just playing on their phone or whatever that is. Um, but that um, means that we're not going through some of those cycles that can be really helpful for feeling just restored and refreshed and um, feeling good the next day. So this, the sort of cycle you said, it's like um, roughly around 90 to 100 minutes and then it repeats itself. So you go through sort of, so could you pinpoint it down to kind of chronological order? So it would be light, then like sort of deep light and then deep kind of sleep mm -hmm. and then it repeats itself again after uh, then it would go to REM after the deep so then it would do the REM and then it would start over so um, we'd go back into that light kind of light or kind of light deep that you said <laughs> deep um, REM so that would kind of repeat um, throughout the night and does it like has it ever changed for like any other people like would that be the same case for every single person because I know sometimes whenever I track my sleep with my Fitbit, now I'm not saying Fitbit's great for tracking stuff, um, but it kind of gives you like an estimation. And 
there's been some times where I'll just doze off straight away. Like maybe I've been, uh, maybe I've been staying up past the usual time that I go to sleep and I'll hit the, my pillow will hit the head and then that'll be me out for a while. And then whenever I wake up in the morning, I look at my uh, tracker, I can see that like I was in a deep state sort of at the very beginning of my sleep. Is that like an anomaly or would that be, uh, would that be the case with like some people? Um, it's just going to kind of depend. Uh, so the light sleep might not last very long. It's going to really depend on different factors. So for example, if someone didn't sleep very well the night before, or even a few nights before, they might go into that deep sleep a little bit faster. Um, but the light sleep, it's, it's going to kind of depend. It's pretty short in general. So it's not necessarily a long period of time where you're going from that light to deep, but it is just kind of a little bit of like steps to get into that deep. Um, but what you mentioned, that's not necessarily concerning. Some people um, who have sleep disorders, they might not go into the sleep stages in kind of a predictable way. Um, so people with like narcolepsy, for example, they might um, go into REM sleep, you know, in the beginning, right in the beginning of when they fall asleep. Um, so Fitbits and other trackers, I would encourage people to consider those as like a estimate, a rough gauge, um, but they have been shown to be not necessarily the most precise, but I think it's good for just giving like a general idea of, of things. Um, but yeah, the most kind of precise results would be in a, in a sleep lab. Um, but what you described is not necessarily concerning. Okay, cool. So I'm all good. <laughs> <laughs> for what you shared, at least that, that little tidbit, it doesn't really sound necessarily concerning because we do go from that light to deep sleep pretty quickly. Okay, cool. And um, you mentioned before as well. So in our uh, REM sleep, that's kind of where we recover emotionally. Um with the deep sleep, I know that that's really important for like muscle and um, recovery, isn't it? Yep. So the deep sleep is going to be considered kind of the restorative sleep. So that's where um, our body is going to be able to restore its, uh, itself, our mind, um, the, kind of like the junk that circulates through our brain throughout the day is considered to be removed during that stage. So it's definitely really important, especially if you are someone who's physically active and working out. And um, we really want that body to be in that deep sleep to get the restorative sleep. So you can, you know, not be, um, not have any kind of negative effects, especially if you are very physically active. So especially if you are someone who's active, we definitely want to get that restorative sleep. So your body has a chance to kind of recover itself basically. And so in the deep sleep, I kind of, it, it sort of would take over uh it would recover the muscles and like the nervous system and stuff like that there but whenever you're talking about REM sleep emotionally is that kind of just what's going on in our brain then it's happening in both. So in the deep sleep, it's happening in the brain and the body. So REM sleep, it's just thought to be more responsible for remo uh, removing kind of like the emotional components of our day. So someone who let's say is under a lot of stress, but avoids it all day, that person might be more likely to have nightmares, stress related nightmares, just because they are not really processing it during the day processed. Um, so that's something to consider for people. Um, so it's kind of considered to be, it's not only, I wouldn't call REM sleep only like the, the mind, but a big thing that we think REM sleep does is to help with regulating emotions and, and processing emotions. Okay, cool. Um, I forgot to mention before we start recording, uh, just as a disclaimer for everyone as well, uh, Zoom sometimes comes in and out. So if I'm like looking at you too long and like I'm not moving, I'm not being a mime or anything like that. They're trying to like hold my breath. <laughs> it's just because the screen is froze. Okay. Um, or like if it goes off and that, um, remember the dial up internet where it's like, like it might be like that. So, um, okay. Is everyone bear of us? <laughs> um, okay. Whereabouts where are you in the States? Sorry, you're in, uh, did you say I'm in Carolina? the States, in, in Chicago. Oh, Chicago, right. Okay, I've actually got two friends who um, were from Chicago, and then they moved out to the West Coast and to uh, San Francisco. But I think they wish they were back in Chicago. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so I've always found that kind of fascinating, like how do nightmare nightmares um, occur and like how does it change from like the dream to like a nightmare and is a nightmare kind of, it is a dream, but it's just what we class as like a bad experience. Yes, it's going to kind of depend on the person. So a nightmare for most people will be something that feels more distressing. And oftentimes when we wake up from nightmares, there might be some more um, 
kind of nervous system arousal. So a lot of times when people wake up from nightmares, there's going to be maybe like their heart rates increase, maybe they're sweating more. Um, so there is going to be kind of more um, activation there as well versus a dream uh, might not necessarily, we might wake up and think like, oh, that was weird or I don't know what that was about, but we might not necessarily have some of those kind of distress feelings um, that happen. Okay. And um, it's kind of similar to like, like a dog as well like have you ever do you have any animals yourself like pets i do i have a puppy mm. do you ever like watch them when they sleep and they like you can see like their legs like twitching or something like that there and mm-hmm. you're kind of thinking like i wonder what they're dreaming about <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and actually during REM, so our body has processes that um, are supposed to be preventing us from acting out our dreams. Um, so someone who, let's say, maybe has like a REM disorder, they might actually act out their dreams. Um, but most of us are, our body has kind of these processes that are going to make sure that we are still during that, just so obviously like we don't get injured or actually do whatever's happening in the dream. Um, but there, that is kind of a process um, designed to keep us safe, basically. Yeah, I think I remember reading about that um, where um, whenever you are beginning to sleep, your body sort of uh, puts you like into a vegetative state. So it shuts down your whole nervous system, doesn't it? Um, it, it the, for during the REM, yes. So it kind of it doesn't necessarily shut down the nervous system, but it will um, decrease kind of our muscle um, abilities. Um, so we're not, you know, like thrashing around or, or punching anyone in her sleep if there's someone next to it. Yeah. And so like for that instance, if someone was sleepwalking, like what's sort of going on in their body and why are they sleepwalking then? So sleepwalking, that's going to be probably something going on medically, like a sleep disorder um, if someone is sleepwalking. So that's always going to be something that we might want to, um, that would be a good like primary care doctor or general practitioner focus and maybe even possibly um, neurology or a sleep clinic involvement. But if someone is sleepwalking, then there's some kind of sleep process that's not being inhibited while they're sleeping. Um, so that's going to be something that we definitely would want to get a sleep study for. And is it like, I know you said that it's more like towards a general practitioner, but um, just like say with your experience, um, there's that kind of myth where you're like, never wake up a sleepwalker. You're supposed to just direct them back, back to their bed. Mm -hmm. Is that because what they could just freak out and kill you or something? (laughs) So someone who's sleepwalking, they're really not aware of that process. But if you were to, you know, kind of startle them, they could, and this would still be something very much kind of not conscious, but they could in a startled, even not totally like conscious state, because they are their body it's not like for us when we're sleeping someone who's not sleepwalking um the muscles are not going to do that because during that let's say dreaming we our muscles are kind of slowed down or paused um but with someone who's sleepwalking that's not the case so they could just accidentally harm someone okay yeah that kind of makes sense because the clip that always comes to my mind is step brothers do you know whenever they're both uh sleepwalking will ferrell and john c Riley, and then they like <laughs> the christmas presents and buy it. <laughs> um so with the likes of uh, w- with the disorders, I have got a couple that I've uh, written down here that I want to ask you sort of the different processes on how they kind of occur. Um, and I know you mentioned before, there's so many factors that can uh, to lead to different disorders. Um, but we'll start off with uh, kind of, I suppose, like it's not really a disorder. It's kind of annoying um, if you have a partner who snores. Why do people snore whenever they sleep? Yes, I'm very glad that you brought that up. So um, this is not always going to be the case for everyone, but snoring can be indicative of something called sleep apnea. So for people who um, have trouble sleeping or feeling refreshed in the morning, a lot of times if they are snoring, um, it could be because they have undiagnosed sleep apnea. So basically sleep apnea is when we're sleeping, the airway closes. So as we're starting to go into that deep sleep that we need for restorative sleep, the body kind of like jolts us awake. Um, The person might not even always be aware that they're awake because they then just kind of go back into that light sleep again. Um, but basically the, the, we stop breathing if we have sleep apnea. Um, so snoring is kind of a way to try to catch some of that air. Um, so snoring is not, if you are snoring, it doesn't mean you have sleep apnea, but if you do snore pretty loudly and you've been told that, I would definitely encourage people to um, 
talk with their doctor about that and just make sure to get sleep apnea ruled out. Um, because if, if that is the, uh, the cause for poor sleep, then it's something that can definitely be addressed. Um, but basically people with sleep apnea, if it's not addressed, then they're going to basically wake up feeling unrefreshed, even if they got, let's say eight hours, it's a very light sleep the entire time. So they're really not going to feel very refreshed. They're going to have a lot of daytime sleepiness. Um, so some things for, you know, people listening, if you are snoring, um, if you do experience daytime sleepiness, if someone has ever said that they've heard you kind of like gasping for air, or maybe stop breathing, kind of like a, kind of like that, um, I would definitely talk with your primary care doctor just to make sure that you're getting that ruled out, um, because that is something that can be addressed and really make a very, very big difference in sleep. And it's very common and highly underdiagnosed. Yeah. So with whenever you do get diagnosed, I mean, there's different proce procedures that they take on. So, I mean, there's the sleep apnea machine. Is it kind of, I've never researched what it actually does, but is it kind of like a face mask that pumps oxygen into your, into your, uh, into your body whenever you're sleeping? So it's basically, it's not oxygen, but it is air. So the, it, it pumps kind of an airflow basically to keep your airway open. Um, so there's not necessarily, it's not like an oxygen machine, but it is um, designed to keep the airway open so people can breathe better at night. Um, so that can make a, just the world of a difference for someone with sleep apnea. Um, some of the machines, you know, there's a lot of new technology with it. Um, some of them are not the most comfortable at first, but it's something that a lot of people do get used to. And, and there's also other options than the machine. It just kind of depends on the person and, um, you know, the options that would be available to them. And with sleep apnea, is it, is there any kind of causes that are more on the priority list, like in the pecking order, like say like with, um, high stressful situations, would that lead to it or like maybe like a poor diet? Um, so one of the risk factors for sleep and apnea, apnea is obesity. So poor diet, it can definitely be associated with that. So people who are, um, you know, considered to be overweight or in the obese range, they are going to have a higher risk factor for sleep apnea, especially because there's going to be more, um, you know, kind of fat and girth around the neck. And that's where our airway is. Um, if someone has a really big neck circumference, which can be related to obesity, but not necessarily, that can also be a risk factor. Um, males tend to be diagnosed with sleep apnea more than females as well. Um, and then people um, over the age of 60. But you don't have to have all of those risk factors, but I would say the main ones, if you're listening right now, if you're told that you um, are snoring wildly, you've ever been heard gasping for air, you're experiencing daytime sleepiness, um, and if you have any of those other risk factors, or even if you don't, if you just have the ones I just mentioned, I would definitely encourage you to talk with your, your um, doctor, um, because not only does sleep apnea, does it negatively impact their sleep, but it can also increase um, the risk for a lot of different medical conditions as well. So whenever someone has... Uh well, whenever someone's snoring, you always like, uh, like if you're with your partner and you just push them like to roll over on their side, I've just thought about it now. It's because whenever you're in that sort of recovery position, that gives you more of a clear airway. So is that why they tell people to roll people over who are snoring? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people are most prone to snoring on their back. Um, and so when people are on their side, they're going to probably be snoring less. Also something, if you are um, the partner of someone who does snore very loudly and you find it to be interfering in your own sleep. Um, sometimes there are um, those beds where you can lift like one half of the mattress or even mm. someone propping up their head um, to have their, their head be a little bit higher. That can also help with reducing snoring. Um, other things that can in increase snoring for most people, whether they have sleep apnea or not, is alcohol, especially high, um, high use of alcohol, because that can also kind of like close the airway some when sleeping. And so that can also increase snoring quite a bit. So if you have a partner and he is, he or she is only snoring after drinking a lot, then that might be something you can talk with them about as well. I just want to put a disclaimer right there. Cause I know my girlfriend's going to be listening to this. Uh, you don't, you don't snore, honey. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so kind of leading on from sleep apnea, then I suppose you get into the more serious, uh, disorders. Um, I, I take it does, so say like someone with insomnia, would they experience sleep apnea first before they have that or could insomnia just come about at any stage? 
Um, so someone who has um, insomnia because of sleep apnea, you know, we're going to think about that as, you know, the sleep apnea probably being the primary, if we can resolve the sleep apnea and then they don't have any sleep issues anymore, then that would be kind of considered resolved. But insomnia, so clinical insomnia is characterized by someone having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up earlier than intended. So like if you need to be up at seven, but you're up at five in the morning every day, um, several times a week over a period you know, of a few months. And not only are they having those um, symptoms, but it's causing some kind of impairment in their lives. So they're you know, kind of having trouble getting through their work day. They're really, they're more irritable with their friends or family or kids, or they're having other kinds of issues. So not only is it trouble falling and staying asleep or waking up too early, but it's also causing some kind of issue for them. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, it's up to, at least in the United States, up to 30% of people do meet the criteria for clinical um, insomnia, but a lot of people, way more than 30% experience some issues with it. So and with insomnia, I mean, it can it kill you directly or is it sort of the effects of insomnia that can kill you? So like you said, like your body's not going in the deep state of sleep, so you, you can't recover um, and your body can would you would it be fair to say your body breaks down if you do have insomnia? Um, I think that's something that could definitely happen because if someone is chronically not getting, you know, quality sleep, and I would say quality sleep is more important than the actual hours, um, it can cause a lot of physical problems. It can increase the risk for a lot of physical problems. It can increase the risk for a lot of emotional and mental health issues as well. Um, so when we are not sleeping well, um, the body is going to release more cortisol, which is the stress hormone. Um, so a lot of times people who are not sleeping well, they're also going to have much more stress, much more anxiety. And and then unfortunately, anxiety, um, because the body is way more activated, we have more muscle tension, that can also make it hard to sleep. So it kind of turns into this not very helpful cycle. Um, you know, not sleeping well also can put us at risk for um, higher rates of depression or other kinds of mood disorders as well, because the sleep is really important for that emotional processing, for that restorative sleep. So it definitely can impact us in a variety of physical and emotional ways, especially if it is chronic. And I take it it can like obviously like have a huge effect on your brain as well. Like, I mean, there's sometimes whenever I've like, I haven't had enough sleep, like maybe it would have been like five hours or something like that there. Like say like I was uh, getting up early for a flight or something like that. And you, you know how it is, like you're excited and you can't get to sleep and you try and force yourself to sleep, but you can't. And then you only get like five hours and then you, you can wake up with like a headache. So like I take it for like people with like who have those kind of more stronger um, disorders. I mean, that can like have an effect on your brain um, for a long time. Like it, it kind of, it's kind of like you're self-sabotaging yourself. Like you're kind of like turning your brain in the mush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could definitely impact us cognitively. So people who are not sleeping well, um, they're going to have much poor attention, concentration, memory, problem solving. Um, so all of those things are definitely going to be lower. And, you know, I'm glad that you said that because a lot of people, I work with a lot of people who are very successful, they're very high functioning, but they kind of do themselves a disservice because they say, okay, well, I'm so busy, I'm just going to not sleep, you know, as much as I need. But what's happening is then they're waking up, they're groggy, they're tired, they're not attentive. And so everything they're doing throughout the day, it takes so much more effort and time than if they got that good night of sleep, you know, woke up ready to go, they're going to be, you know, putting in less time, but putting in a lot better kind of, you know, um, product, basically. So if, if we, you know, under, I'm sure everyone's heard the term, you know, work smarter, not harder. And I think one of the most important aspects of that is definitely not skimping on sleep. Um, because when you get a good night's sleep, that's when you're going to wake up just much more ready to take on the day versus is going through the day getting what you need to do done but doing it with like way more effort and like sluggishness and low energy yeah because i mean you see like people who are um very inspirational like the likes of like arnold schwarzenegger like kevin hart and like they'll turn around and say that they've only had like five or six hours sleep and um, i think there's actually a famous quote by arnold schwarzenegger where he's like uh people who say they don't get enough sleep i laugh at them or something like that there he's like i get six hours and i'm just like after reading the um why we sleep book by matthew walker it kind of opened my eyes it's like wow like i was like thinking that like six hours was enough sleep but i mean here's kind of another thing that um i only learned about as well and it was kind of through my uh, fitbit tracker through most of the night as well you're probably awake for like an hour well between 45 minutes to like an hour 
And so like you could be saying that you're getting eight hours sleep because you're looking at your clock and like it's 12 o'clock at night and then you wake up at eight o'clock. Yep, I got eight hours sleep. But you're not, you're only really again like around 70 eight hours sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, waking up in the middle of the night is normal for most people. It's as long as we can go back to bed, that's not really something that we would, you know, consider to be um, an issue. And sometimes we wake up actually without even, even knowing it. And that's going to be most likely between that you know, your REM sleep and then going into that light sleep again, that's when we're most likely to wake up. Um, But yes, it is very common actually to wake up. So if you're, you know, listening to this and you're thinking, well, sometimes they do wake up in the middle of the night, that's not necessarily an issue unless you're having trouble going back to sleep. So if you're waking up with your mind racing with a million things and that's happening regularly, then that's something that we would definitely want to address. Yeah, definitely. And with uh, the likes of like people who, um, so, I mean, whenever your body is kind of in that like usual routine, like I always like try and say that like routine is crucial. Um, and I, I'm not like, uh, I'm not a spokesperson for routine or anything like that there because I'll like go for like a couple of weeks on them where I'm in a good routine. And then there may be like one week where I'll like fall short. Um, but I mean, routine is, is very crucial and it's crucial for your sleep as well, I think, because um after reading up on like the circuit day and rhythm and stuff like that there and then whenever your body releases your melatonin you shouldn't suppress it you should um embrace it and then that's whenever you should go to sleep naturally i think with obviously technology and um, especially with the age of uh with social media as well i mean a lot of people are going to sleep with their phone in their hands and stuff like that or even like their phone under their pillow which i think is really bad um it's a uh, that kind of blue light filter is it's kind of it, it's bad in a way i mean we're kind of surrounded by it all the time that's why like people say don't have tvs in your or in your bedroom and stuff like that there make sure you have all your technology or your bedroom and maybe like use like dim lighting and stuff like that i mean how how bad is it to suppress your melatonin like whenever it is being released like can it have like serious effects like i mean does it obviously like over time, will it lead to those disorders? Or, I mean, should you embrace your melatonin as soon as you can feel yourself like being sleepy? I, can, I hope that kind of makes sense and what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it, it's it's really important, I think, for everyone um, listening, and this is something that often is not really explained when they do say, like, oh, power off your devices or don't have a TV in your bed, but we do operate on a 24-hour clock, all of us, um, which is that circadian rhythm. It's kind of our biological internal clock, and when we do have a pretty pretty solid, it doesn't need to be very rigid, but some kind of routine and structure of when we're eating and sleeping, that's usually when the clock is running very efficiently um, and is going to help us start to feel sleepy around the same time, we're going to be waking up around the same time, and that can really promote um, really quality sleep. So having that routine is really helpful, especially waking up at the same time every day. Um, most people, they're going to naturally wake up who are on kind of like what we would consider like a normal circadian or standard circadian rhythm. They're going to usually wake up with the sun for the most part. Um, so if we are waking up around the same time every day and we have other factors in place, then naturally the body is going to start to release melatonin also around the same time at night. Night. Um, so if someone's on like a 10 to 6, let's say, sleep window or so, um, the body's going to start to release melatonin a little bit before that to induce the sleepiness. So being, you know, keeping with that natural rhythm, that's ultimately what's going to really set us up for success because that's when the body is naturally wanting to get that sleep, be on that regular rhythm to help us wake up, feel refreshed and feel good. Um, so the problem with the blue light devices is basically they send an opposite signal to the brain of like, wake up, wake up. So your melatonin naturally is starting to work. It's going into your body and the blue light is kind of doing the opposite. So it's basically just kind of like canceling it out. So someone could feel sleepy, let's say, but if then they're getting like too much stimulation from the blue light, they still might not be able to fall asleep. Mm. And <clears throat> with uh i mean with technology like the rise in it and with all that blue light i mean is there any studies that sort of come to mind i mean people would like say during the 90s and 80s like there wasn't enough sleep like say we'll take example america i mean is there any studies out there that showed it um i mean sleep disorders or people aren't getting enough sleep now than they were back then 
Um, there's a lot of uh, tons of studies um, showing how rates of insomnia have increased over time, and that can be for a lot of reasons. Um, definitely access to technology like this directly causes this, but there's going to be kind of related things. So an increase in technology for a lot of people, they feel the need to be constantly on um, and responsive. Um, and we have so many different factors and kind of different things that we're doing. So that can definitely lead bring down at the end of the night, which most people do. And that's often a big reason people have trouble falling asleep at night. Sorry, it literally just cut off there. Can you repeat what you just said? I'm so sorry. Uh, which part? The whole thing? Uh, no, not the whole thing. Uh, just the last segment that you just kind of done there. Um, um, I, I think what I said. I think what I said was a lot of people they have problems falling asleep, uh, very much related to technology, and just trouble kind of turning their mind off. So a lot of people uh, will be working. Let's say they go to bed. Like in theory, would go to bed around ten or eleven. They might be working until ten or 11, or they might be thinking about work, or, you know, they might just have trouble kind of shutting things down. Um, technology is definitely not going to help with that, because it's really not doing anything to promote sleep and relaxation. In fact, kind of the opposite, it's interfering with some of that natural melatonin that's telling us it's time to go to bed. Okay. And do you agree with people who like, because uh, I, I know there's some supplements for like melatonin release, like, I mean, is that good to be putting into your body? Like, because I mean, like what time and all would you have to like take that for that to be released in your body? Yeah, the, the thing with melatonin supplements, so melatonin is something natural in the body, but a lot of times people will have tried melatonin, but they've seen that it doesn't work for them. And the reason for that is because there's all these other things that aren't really in place to support that. Because if we think about what is the purpose of melatonin as it naturally occurs or with a supplement is to help promote sleepiness. But if we're doing things that are the opposite of that, so you can take all the melatonin you want, but if you are you know, thinking about your entire work day, you're watching TV, you're glued to your phone right before bed, um, it's still not going to really be very effective. For some people, it can be helpful. Um, I would always recommend anyone with any supplements, always running them by their um, general practitioner, because some supplements for certain people, they seem kind of like natural and safe, but you never know what they might interact with. And we've seen that in primary care quite a bit. Um, so I would always encourage people before trying any supplements to always just run it by your doctor, especially if you are on medications or have any kind of medical issues. That's my next uh, question I was going to ask you. So, I mean, with uh, the medication for people who, who can't get to sleep, is it like, is there high doses of melatonin in that medication or is there like tranquilizers or something? Like how, how do they kind of work? Um, so melatonin will often be prescribed in primary care, but you know, like I mentioned to you, for some people it might be helpful for if they have these other components in place. Um, but for a lot of people, if they have all these opposing things to sleep, it's not going to really be helpful. There are some medications that can be prescribed. They're not tranquilizers, but there are some medications that can be helpful <laughs> for <that> sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for sleep, unlike a lot of other conditions, medication aside from melatonin is considered a last resort. Um, that some, you know, there's a lot of like medical conditions or issues where medication might be kind of a, fr a frontline treatment, but for insomnia specifically, it is considered a last resort um, because there are so many other factors that go into sleep. And oftentimes when people are having insomnia, it's not really related to something medical. It can be, but usually it's related to their sleep factors. So some of the things I mentioned to you already are, um, you know, not powering off at night, not kind of doing things to relax the body and mind, having these opposing signals from um, the blue light, spending a lot of time in bed awake, that's going to be a big one. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into insomnia. So medication is really considered a last, absolute last resort because there's many other things to address first that are, that are more helpful. Yeah. And I mean, what kind of tips would you give to people um, on sort of reducing like factors that will keep them awake at night? Like what, what would be like the optimal sleep, like how many hours and what your environment should be in your bedroom? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's there's probably a million things we can talk about, but I'll kind of just start with the things that I see as having the biggest impact. Um, so a lot of people that we see have something we call conditioned insomnia, which is basically they have their brain over time has associated the bed with a place of non-sleep. Um, so anything that we're doing in bed 
that's not sleeping is telling your brain, oh, this bed is a place of watching TV, thinking about my day, um, tossing and turning, even eating. People do work in their bed. So anything we're doing in bed that is not sleeping, that can lead to this conditioned insomnia where we get into bed and the brain's not thinking, oh, time to go to bed. It's thinking like activity and, and doing all these things. So I, number one recommendation there would be to make sure that anything you're doing in bed that's not sleeping, aside from sexual activity, um, to do out of bed, especially work stuff. If you're thinking and feeling really anxious in bed, um, we're going to want to get out of bed until we actually feel like we are able to fall asleep. So that's a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, most people are doing things in bed that are not sleeping. So I, that probably applies to most people, myself included sometimes. Um, so, you know, along the same lines of that, we talked about the circadian rhythm. Um, waking up at the same time every day is going to be really important, especially if you are having sleep issues um, for, you know, a couple of weeks on weekends as well. Try waking up at the same time. I know it's very tempting to sleep in on weekends, but if you're someone who's, who's struggling with sleep, we want to regulate your, your circadian kind of clock a little bit better and waking up at the same time every day is going to help with that. Um, at night, whenever you think is kind of your, your bedtime. So let's say 11 PM, if possible, we really want to spend that last 30 to 60 minutes um, before bed in kind of like a relaxation zone, or we call it buffer zone where we're actively doing things to calm um, the body and the mind. So if you don't have 60 minutes, that's okay. Even if you don't have 30, at least trying for like 15, 20, you know, 30 would really be great if you can. Um, but that's when we're going to want to power off the devices and we're going to want to do things that are going to help promote sleepiness and relaxation. Um, so that could be reading like a, a print book. It can be listening to music. Um, things that are going to actually physically force the body and the mind to calm down are things like deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation. That's one of the best things that people can do during that time to help kind of like relieve the tension from the body. Um, but having that buffer zone or relaxation zone is really important and making sure we're not getting into bed until we actually feel sleepy. So I'm sure many people listening to this right now have had really frustrating times of getting into bed. You think you want to go to sleep, but then you're just tossing and turning and thinking and you know, just not able to sleep. We really want to avoid that. So we want to really use that buffer zone to kind of induce that rest and calm, start to feel sleepy. And then we're going to want to get into bed. That's why I was just going to uh, pick up on a point there that you just mentioned um, about the reading as well. So by the way, those tests were great. And um, I'm sure that they're kind of the basic things that people can do. Um, what do you think about like Kindles and like uh, reading like books on like iPads and stuff like that there? Um, I don't see anything wrong with that, but not during the buffer zone. So once we're getting into that relaxation time for bed zone, um, we want to power off the devices. So that includes TVs, tablets, phones, whatever is going to be giving that blue light. Um, we're going to want to kind of say goodbye to that for the night and then really start to do other things that are going to um, help promote the sleepiness that we're trying to get. Okay, cool. And then um, I suppose a couple of questions that I want to uh, finish up on was, uh, one was to actually know what your your doctor so I would like to uh, know what your research was and your doctorate so my doctorate um so I'm also my background's in neuropsychology so mine was um on there's like um, an intelligence test that we give and it was to see if we can predict um or or um not predict, but to, why am I blinking on the word? Basically to, to see if someone, if we can catch people with dementia early on through this intelligence oh, test. Right. Yeah, so not quite related to sleep, <laughs> but yeah. um, my background is in neuropsychology and health psychology. And then I did um, some of my training and fellowship in behavioral sleep medicine. So that's something that I've really enjoyed um, and kind of gone a little bit more in that direction. But, you know, like we talked about earlier, you know, regularly having poor sleep, it can really impact our um, cognitive abilities as well as all kinds of abilities. So getting that sleep is so important for so many factors. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, so what are you kind of doing now? I know you mentioned that you're working with uh, veterans and stuff like that. Is there any kind of like uh, research projects that you're trying to like, I, I don't know, maybe like some studies that you're doing that you could maybe share with us? 
Um, so I'm more clinical right now. So I work in the hospital. So I work actually with um, veterans to help them improve their sleep. I mean, I work with them with other things as well, but um, basically people, we will do the assessment to see if they meet the criteria for the insomnia. And then from there, we will do a treatment that has a lot of evidence behind it. It's really considered the gold standard for insomnia. It's called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Mm. Um, so I do that in my, in my kind of, um, in my private coaching practice as well. Um, but for those also on this call, if you are struggling with insomnia, then that's really considered the gold standard. So I would encourage you to look for a provider in your area who offers that. There's also a great um, free app um, actually through the Department of Veterans Affairs and it's called CBTI Coach. Um, there you're gonna see tons of sleep tips. It's gonna have some of that relaxation buffer zone um, sections, some things you can do during that time. You can track your sleep with the sleep log. So it's kind of more of like a self kind of help app, but that's also a really great um, option as well. Brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. I, I kind of think we've touched on everything. Well, I've touched on everything that I wanted to talk about. Is there anything else that you could kind of think of that you would maybe want to share with listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just a good kind of way to conclude is sleep is something that's very treatable. A lot of people, they have suffered from poor sleep for so long that they've, even though it is causing a lot of issues for them, they kind of, it's just something that they're dealing with. Um, but, you know, I do want to let people know out there that if you're having trouble with sleep, whether it is you know, meets that criteria for insomnia, or you're just having trouble with sleep, there's really a lot of changes that can be made. Um, and you improving your sleep, it can lead to so many great changes in just your mood, your energy, your productivity, um, you know, you're really just you being efficient throughout the day and whatever it is that you want to accomplish. So I would encourage you to, you know, not um, ignore any sleep issues. If you're having them, then thinking about, you know, considering some of the things that we talked about today, to see if you want to make any of those changes. Um, if you're feeling like the sleep issues are really interfering, than considering um, engaging in that treatment that I mentioned. And I forgot to mention, it's a pretty brief treatment. It's usually like six to 10 sessions and people see huge improvements in their sleep. Um, but, you know, following the tips that we talked about today um, and seeing, you know, how that might help you. But I do just want to encourage people that if you are struggling with sleep, you know, you certainly don't, don't need to struggle with it. There is a lot that can be done. Amazing. That's such a good uh, note to end on. Uh, just before I let you go, um, where are you on uh, social media? I know you're on Instagram, but I mean, do you have like a website or YouTube or anything like that? Um, yes. So I am um, on Instagram is where I post a lot of tips on sleep, on stress, on other kind of like health behavior topics. Um, so that's at Dr. Julia Kogan, K-O-G-A-N. Um, and then my website where um, different clients will connect is just drjuliacogan.com. Brilliant. That's amazing. You, you too, probably coming soon. Yes, definitely do it. It's amazing. <laughs> um, you'll get a lot of views on that. Uh, Julia, thanks very much for doing this. Um, I think, I mean, I, I have touched on everything that I could sort of talk to you about. Um, if I do think of anything else, I'll be sending you some messages. Maybe um, my girlfriend might start snoring and then I might need to get more tips off you or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, honestly, thanks very much for taking the time or your day to do this. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>